machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's a, it's, it's a very broad topic, very big field. Um, you know, I think Gartner says that it, the industry is very much still in the hype cycle. So the idea that um, when a new technology comes in, um, there's some kind of ear-pleasing words that get thrown around, and there's this idea that this, this thing is now the answer. Um, so generally, there tends to be a lot of hype and a lot of excitement, and then over time, the actual applications that work start to settle in, and it becomes part of the fabric of how we do things as opposed to the answer. So um, what, what I want to do today is, is really focus on a very specific aspect of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, which is its applications in demand planning. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about kind of how we see demand planning as well. Um, but again, this is just to narrow on a very specific topic, because again, um, machine learning and AI is as broad as, in some ways, the internet. So it can apply to just about anything in supply chain, depending on the use case, depending on the data availability, depend on, depending on the mathematical solving construct, um, and depending on whether or not it actually makes sense. So we're going to narrow in on that a little bit. What is it? Um, I mean, <laughs> I was, I was uh, contemplating opening with the discussion about what do we mean by intelligence anyway, but that's a little too philosophical <laughs> and broad. I love that stuff, but um, it might bore most of you very quickly. Um, but. But what it is, is, is something that looks at um, large sets of data, and so the benefit of it is it often can be um, uh, disparate, um, not connected, and not similarly formatted sets of data. And what machine learning does is we'll go out and look at various sets of data and tries to build, um, I guess, what we'd call the relationship between correlation and causation. So in other words, when this happens over here, does that create a relationship to something over here? And not only that, but is there a kind of a lead or a lag effect? Because sometimes something happens here, but then there's not an implication or an impact until, say, six months later. Um, so there's kind of a, a lead and lag with these sorts of things, this, this, these things as well. Um, so what it's trying to do is, is, is look for these correlations, um, look for correlation and causation, and then in the context of at least of demand planning is then to be able to make automatic suggestions back in terms of how to influence the forecast moving forward. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to just give you, um, uh, you know, a fairly finite example of what some of this looks like in, in forecasting and inventory optimization and in replenishment planning. Um, the way we define demand planning is that it, to plan demand, it requires all of those elements. We have to have a forecast, we have to have um, an optimized inventory profile, and we also have to have a replenishment plan to make sure we have the right stock in the right quantity, right location, right cost, and so on. So all those are important. Um, the, the tool set that we're going to show you today, uh, at least in the U.S., is integrated with what's, what's called the FRED, which is the Federal Reserve Economic Database. And so what it does is it, it for example, generates a baseline forecast. Um, it also looks at history. Um, but what it's doing is going into the Federal Reserve Economic Database and saying things like, well, we're giving you know, interest rates and you know, fiscal and monetary policy, um, housing starts, and so on. As we see those, um, that data change, does that appear to have any sort of influence on the historical demand? And then based on that, if we have a sense of what's going to happen in the future, how might we actually alter the forecast moving forward? So that's one very broad example. So what it's doing, it's literally just going to the Federal Reserve Economic Database, looking at all the relationships between the data, and then also looking at what's happening in the history of the, of the products that this business is actually supplying and then making adjustments on that basis. So what do I mean by um, big data? Um, again, this, this isn't clearly not a definitive answer. Um, this is, again, more in relation to the, to the demand planning aspect that we're talking about today. But I've just mentioned economic databases. So that, you know, that may or may not have, a, have an implication. I know one of the companies that um, um, uses a particular technology we'll talk about today. One of the companies that used it in the U.S. was looking at the volume of steel imports because typically there was a lower price. So what they would see if the volume of steel imports increased, the demand for their products would decrease. Um, and it was usually four to six months later. So they, they worked out that correlation and were able to factor that into their, their sales and operations planning and the demand planning as well. Um, weather is always a big one, you know, so particularly in retail. Um, or maybe if we're selling a very seasonal product, like ice cream or something like that. Um, <laughs> um, you know, weather can ha have an impact. Um, and, and, and look, most of the, the cases I'm thinking about today are really more around um, kind of traditional retail, distribution, manufacturing, service and repair type businesses. 
obviously weather and big data, um, I've seen some great applications for that in agriculture, you know, and that, that has a very clear um, implication. Um, now, the interesting thing about some of that stuff, though, is I, I saw a great case study on an organization that's based out of New York that grows food in, in basically inside in a warehouse. So it's all temperature controlled, um, and, 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 what, um, and, and the light is regulated as well because it's artificial light. And the interesting thing is they use machine learning to work out which inputs at what times affect crop yield. Now, in that case, um, what I would call the relationship between causation and correlation is very clear. So there's a correlation, and you kind of know it's causing it. Now, the interesting thing, one of the questions that comes down to this is just because I'm seeing a correlation between something, did it cause it? Does that make sense? You know? um, so in other words, I'm noticing that most people here are wearing darkly colored jackets. Um, so it seems like every time we have these breakfasts, darkly colored jackets appear. So do this, does the breakfast cause the darkly colored jacket, or is it something else? And so that's, that's one of the questions to look at as well. As I might see a correlation, does it mean it actually is the reason? Um, perhaps, perhaps not. Okay. Um, so we've got things like weather, temperature, um, price, and cost changes. So again, if we're changing the selling price um, of our products, if our competitors are changing their selling prices, um, where I think um, is, there's a, a big opportunity in machine learning and AI is, is what I call the horizontal relationships in demand planning, because oftentimes a business will say, well, if this product's increasing, it generally means that these go down. So what does that do for the overall category? So we need to have a look at that as well. So in a big data sense, if you're looking at um, historical demand and you're saying, here are all my products, and I'm kind of noticing that as certain ones go up, other ones go down, well, we can start automatically building that in versus just looking at kind of a, a singular line-by-line -line forecast, because you know the, the standard approach generally is to take the history and, and project forward, oversimplifying a bit, line-by-line. -line. With machine learning, we now can start taking a broader perspective and saying, but what's actually happening in the population of the things that we, that we supply and sell when that sort of stuff occurs? So price and cost changes, big one. Competitor activity as well. So if you're in a very price-sensitive environment or it's heavily promotions-driven, um, and again, we have a sense both for what our promotions have been and what our competitor activity is as well. Again, it can make some assessments as to whether or not that's going to have an implication. And you can do some uh, scenario planning and demand planning around that, et cetera. OK? Um, yeah, interest rates, um, I'll link that back to the you know, economic database um, type of application. Uh, point of sale data. So. Um, you know, what's actually happening kind of at the most granular level in terms of transactions, and can we make any relationships or correlations between what's happening with our point of sale data and that giving us some indication that, for example, well, if the point of sale data is a lot higher in the morning, perhaps there's not as much in the afternoon. And again, if we have short, um, short shelf life product and frequent deliveries, that can really change the granularity and the accuracy of what we do in the supply chain as well. Um, Population growth. So, I mean, what's actually happening with population in different geographies? Um, and so it might not even be growth. It might be stagnation or decline as well relative to other parts. So if we're seeing that sort of information and seeing that into the future, what might that tell us about where to invest, what sort of supply chain resources we want to have at the place, and what the delivery offer might look like as well? Uh, customer order history. Um, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a bit later and show you some things in the actual demonstration. But um, you know, it's one thing to say, well, this is what our demand was you know, in a given period, because often with the forecasting and demand planning, we're working off you know, monthly buckets. We might be working off weekly buckets. We might be working off daily buckets. Um, but if we start looking at the actual customers and customer order profiles and kind of the lumpiness of that, um, if we start to get a, a clearer picture around that, that can also start to help get more specific around our safety stock policies as well, and actually when we order and where we meet the customer, because again, we had, I was at a business yesterday and had this conversation, and um, you know, they were using averaging techniques. So the idea was and they were a seasonal business. So as the season starts to ramp up, on average, you know, you kind of don't have enough. Then it peaks, and then it starts to go down. And so in other words, we get the total amount right over the peak. It's just that we have half as much as we need at the start and twice as much as we need at the end. So it's not really a slam dunk, but you know, on average, it's pretty good. Um, so the idea is that if we get more and more granular, we can kind of get that supply chain more synchronized and aligned to that. Um, another one, search engine traffic. I'm seeing a lot of that uh, with the, the growth of online. So a lot of the retail businesses we, we work with have both an online and a physical presence. And what they're saying is we can start to kind of get a sense for um, 
what's going to happen in the store or with online orders by the types of searches we're seeing, the volume of searches we're seeing, and so on. So that can now become part of an automated process in your demand planning as well. So these are just some. It's not by, by no means exhaustive, um, but hopefully that gives you flavors for some of the types of data sets that can be incorporated. Because the other thing to kind of keep in mind too, and we'll, we'll talk about some applications, is that you know, depending on how big this gets, there's some serious, pretty serious computing processing you know, grunt going on here. So the question is, is it worth it? You know, so sometimes I think doing some sort of a proof of concept, you know, kind of building those relationships and correlations, actually seeing that it does give you some insight is a really good way to go before just kind of pushing the ship in the water. Yay. There's a few areas that um, AI and machine learning, and by the way, um, just to be clear, um, and the pure mathemat mathematicians in the room will probably raise their eyebrows and look at me, but when we talk artificial intelligence, machine learning, and recurrent neural networks, largely the same thing. Okay, so if, I'm, if I've got artificial intelligence, do I also need machine learning and a recurrent neural network? Not necessarily. Um, they largely do the same thing. There, there are some, I guess, subtle differences that can be profound, but in general, it's the same idea. Um, so given what we talked about in terms of the big data, now there's, there's another point around this, is that to use artificial intelligence and machine learning, and particularly in the tool set that we're going to show you today, you don't actually have to have any external data. This is the other point is that you can work entirely with the data that you have in your own organization. So one is promotions planning. So I talked about using extrinsic or external information in promotions planning. So that might look like, uh, again, what our competitors are doing. But there's another piece, which is we planned this promotion with these attributes over this time frame and so on. This is what we thought was going to happen as a result, but then this is what actually did happen. And not only that, after we ran the promotion, we did get an uplift, but then after a while, we saw a big dip in sales as well. Is that kind of what we wanted to have happen? So again, um, one of the good, good things about AI and machine learning is that we don't necessarily have to go out and start boiling the ocean. We can start just with some internal information and get a lot of value out of that. So to start getting a sense for if we run this promotion at this time in this way, what happens? And are there some other ways of doing that? And also, do we understand, again, that horizontal impact uh, in the business. Leading indicator analysis, um, you'll see an example of this today. This is one where we, um, we might do price changes, sell price changes, and again, what the, the technology does is, is make a, basically determines if there is a statistical relationship, an actual correlation between those things, and then again, we'll recommend an automatic adjustment based on that. And I think in the example we're going to see, it's not only an automatic adjustment, but it's also showing that, well, if we reduce the price of a 1.5 milliliter bottle of water, Closer to the 600 mil, some people people switch out of the 600 to the 1.5, and that's good to know. You know, not just that it's going to create, create more demand, but there'll actually be a switch. Okay, uh, capacity and resource planning. Um, so th this is where, if we've got a situation, and this is it's a very broad topic. It could be in a manufacturing context. Um, it could be in a warehousing context, and this could be around. Um, again, seasonal, you know, seasonal peaks and troughs. It's one thing to look at warehouse capacity as you know the box holds X. But a lot of times capacity is impacted by the processing capacity as well, on um, what time things arrive, what is our put away rate, and so on. So what we can start looking at is, well, it's wonderful to basically have all this product coming in to meet the promotion, but at the same time, if we've seen some issues with capacity in the past, is it can start to look at that and, and start to recommend a different, say, replenishment sort of profile to suit the capacity in the warehouse as well. Um, we've also seen some stuff, we've been doing some work recently in service supply chains. So this is like our in-home care and these sorts of things. So some of the applications we've seen are, um, it's the availability of um, qualified staff with certain skills at a certain time to do work in certain environments. And there was some demand planning around that. But again, the AI piece is, um, again, looking at, well, again, we put these people um, into the field and they were assigned to do the work. What actually happened and what can we learn from what we're seeing about the actual behavior of that whole process? Um, I think this is a really exciting one, is the new item introduction in NPD. The reason why I'm saying really exciting is because um, I'll talk a little bit about the hype and reality, because there's just kind of like, we, we got to do AI and machine learning, go! Um, but, well, I just, I tend to do this. I just say what I need to say and then we'll get to the slide. But um, AI and machine learning, it, it's, a, it's a process of subtle refinement on something that exists. So if you buy a block of land and it's got trees all over it and you know you want to build a nice little you know country house or something, um, you're going to need a landscaper and a gardener. But you don't get the gardener to do the landscaping. 
And what I mean by that is that, um, and I'll show you some evidence for this as well, and I've actually heard it, um, I presented on this topic at the Australian Food and Grocery Council Supply Chain Seminar, and both Johnson & Johnson and Cole said the same thing, as they said, we tried to use AI and machine learning for our base forecasting, don't do that. It's, it's, because it's, 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 it's too fine-tuned, it's too variable, so it kind of gets a bit erratic, um, and there's some, there's some, there's quite a bit of university research that says this as well, is that you need a very good, strong base statistical forecast to kind of anchor the MI to say, well, that's the forecast, and then the AI can do some refinement, but it's not the base forecasting approach. And again, we're seeing that pretty clearly. So just again, um, it's not like we're here and we don't have this, so we'll just jump into AI and that'll solve all our problems. It's, it's not the way. Um, so new item introduction in NPD is a great one because that, that's an area where a lot of the traditional sort of forecasting and planning tools don't do as well. I mean, they, they give you the ability in a lot of cases to take history from other items, but you kind of set up that profile and you do the forecast. Um, this is now saying, again, looking at a broader set of attributes, you know, launch date, launch price, you know, the amount we've made available, what, what discussions we've had with the customer and so on. What actually happens in terms of the uptake? And what are we seeing kind of on an ongoing basis that's happening? And then how do we use that to help the, to, to allow the AI and the machine learning to give us some information about what we can reasonably expect as opposed to tell the machine what we expect and then plan to it that way. So, um, yeah, seeing some really exciting, exciting applications in that area. Um, network inventory optimization. So again, I'm, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff around, you know, route planning and, and sort of supply chain optimization. But what I mean by network inventory optimization is it's not a question of the network itself, but, but my question is, do I have a whole bunch of, you know, do I consolidate all my stock and ship out? Or does it make sense to hold a bit here and a little bit here? Because based on my lead time and demand variability and cost, and that makes more sense. Generally, what we find is, is businesses will make those kind of stocking policy decisions and network flow decisions, and they become somewhat fixed. They might move it every now and then. But the machine learning might look at it and say, well, actually, um, it might make sense to consolidate the safety stock to a point, or because the behavior of the item has changed, we now want to um, bring some more safety stock to this point and then change what's held at the hub. So this is that whole hub and spoke question. Do we go direct? Do we have multiple steps? That all comes down to things like lead time and cost. Um, and so there's some pretty powerful applications in that as well. Um, automated replenishment and supply sourcing. Um, the tool that we will show you today um, has the ability to actually look at, so what it does is it learns from planners. So in other words, as we get recommended orders, it'll build an order, say, well, here's the order, and I build it, and I kind of try to fill, you know, I put it in, in layers, and I try to fill up a container, and I do some pull forward, that sort of thing, and I place the order. I place the order against the forecast that's arrived, but then what actually happened? The system will actually look at all of those things and start to, can start to automate that. And again, there's pieces. So in other words, we could say, we're only comfortable for it to do that if the order value is less than X. And, you know, the forecast accuracy is quite good, and, and, and. And then we're happy for it to do that, or we can open that up a bit more broadly. But again, it learns from what it's actually seeing. Um, always a fun discussion in forecasting and planning, which is the master data management piece, um, which is, yeah, well, that's what our history is, but we're out of stock. You know, so um, one of the things that you're also seeing is, is, is AI and machine learning being used to go back and make automated, automated adjustments to the history to give us a better history profile to do our forward planning. So in other words, if there was a, there was a shutdown, there was a supply shortage, something happened, as opposed to having to go back and fill in the blanks, um, this can do some of that blank filling in, uh, a bit more intelligently. And some of the blank filling approaches um, that I've seen that exist now tend to be a bit crude in some cases. They just take the last point and the next point and just kind of draw a line between them. Maybe, maybe not. Um, and again, we've, we've talked about, um, you know, price changes as well. Now, again, there are many others. This was just trying to give you just a bit of a kind of a, an eight-course degustation menu for what this might look like. Where we're probably seeing the most interest at the moment, as opposed to the most actual benefit, but the most interest is, I think there have been the age-old questions around how do we get more intelligence around that? Um, what happens if we make price changes? And then... What about our promotional activity relative to our competitors? Surely that influences things. Um, and that's kind of been a little bit of a subjective black art. And so there's, there's definitely some interest in there. But that also underscores the point to me is that I think um, it also overemphasizes the importance of forecasting. Forecasting is, I call it kind of the holy trinity in demand planning. You know, you've got your forecasting, your inventory optimization, replenishment planning. Um, 
so far, we're, we're, you know, with those points, we're still only focusing on the forecasting, which is really helpful, but we need all of those elements to really deliver the service and the cost and the working capital result. Um, so, you know, what's available? I'm, I'm just, there's more than two blue boxes out there. Um, but, you know, what we've seen is, um, you know, Amazon Web Services um, has some machine learning forecasting. So basically, you can go onto Amazon, subscribe to it, throw some data out there, and get a forecast back. Um, Again, I'll, and I'll talk about the reality in the hive in just a minute. Um, I'd say that that's interesting. I, I kind of I like the idea. The, the issue I have is that um, you have to be very careful again about the use case and what you're expecting because if we use machine learning for our base forecasting, um, it's it's not it doesn't give as good as results of a lot of the standard forecasting techniques we have. It's a refinement process. So just keep that in mind. It's um, it's a bit like like using a toothbrush to clean your windows. That's <laughs> like the better ways of doing that. Okay, so there are also some uh, systems, some integrated demand and supply chaining systems that you know are best of breed tool sets that I think then if we add machine learning to that, we build on it. We've got the kind of the fundamental prerequisites already in place, and then can take advantage of the, the next step. Thanks, David. And some of the um, research I actually found quite a bit of this stuff, but um, this was a, a university-based um, study. Um, where basically they looked at what they consider traditional, and I actually looked at what they meant by traditional. Let me back up. This was basically lining, saying, let's take similar data sets and let's use a machine learning approach and kind of the more traditional, just using the intrinsic history of the item to forecast forward. Looking at, um, and actually looking at what, what they called their traditional forecasting techniques, they were pretty basic forecasting techniques. I mean, a lot of the tools that um, we're familiar with have things that were far more grunty than what this was. But even so, the traditional techniques outperformed the ML techniques, sorry, the AI, ML techniques, um, on a line-by-line -line basis. Um, the opportunity comes to combine them. So it's not an either-or, it's an and. Does that make sense? It's not a take one or the other, it's, it's something, it's, a, it's sort of the next step. It's so really interesting is we, we heard that um, both um, J and J Coles told us that that was their experience, is that um, at least one, one of those businesses had actually changed their base forecasting to use that, and they actually found that it was it was decreasing results, so they shifted back. Whereas what Coles is saying is they're definitely um, still using their base forecasting approach, but they're actually using some very granular store level data, you know, whether matched with foot traffic and things like that, to then feed to use machine learning to feed back into the base forecast. So I just want to make that point. It's a, it's it's an and, not an or. So what what it, so I keep talking about the you know the the, the holy trinity in demand planning and. The core capability is, you know, the ability to generate a strong um, statistical forecast. And, you know, there's, there's a whole universe of ways of doing that as well. But um, basically, we want something that actually looks at the historical data, does some analysis and testing, and saying this is the most accurate forecast um, out of what my capability set is that there is. I not only get that, I get a sense of the error in that forecast. My inventory optimization approach will take things like my service levels, my service level target, my costs, my constraints and come up with a replenishment quantity or frequency and a safety stock that's cost optimized and service level driven. And once I have my demand plan and my optimized inventory profile, then I can start doing my supply chain planning, replenishment planning, transportation planning, and routing. Um, but really coming up with how do I build a set of orders that again allows me to meet my service levels at the lowest cost with the least amount of effort. So that's that kind of you know, fundamental capability stack. And this says historical data has errors coming up because basically, these sorts of um, these sorts of inputs or these sorts of capabilities do use historical data and sometimes some future data to get a picture of what needs to happen. What, what we're, we're also saying though is if we now take the big data approach, so remember some of the things I put up there before, you could put in economic databases if you want to go that far, you know, price changes, weather changes, um, internet traffic, social media engines and so on, and start to say, well, based on that, if I'm now going to run the machine learning or AI layer on that and then bring that information into, so it's kind of a bottom up and a top down at the same time. And if you think about the old school process, that's usually what it looked like. You would use the base history and then we would use this intelligence to look at the data and say what changes. So now we're augmenting that intelligence with some additional mathematics to help with that process. And to be clear, it's certainly not a replacement for um, human intuition insight, but again, it gives us some insights, and you mentioned a great point about the insight you got about it's actually consecutive number of days, not a, not a monthly figure, which is really great. 
we can now bring that into our sales inventory and operations planning process because it gives us the ability to model and make trade-offs like we really haven't before. And so we've, we've heard a lot about the need to have better scenario planning capabilities. I think this is where AI and machine learning can really help as well. So we marry those things up. But what I also want to point out is that we've got, there's an, a line going from historical data to machine learning as well. Why is that? Because in the tool set that um, um, we're about to show you, and again, we're just going to give you kind of just a small taste of some of these things, um, but what it actually does is it looks at what it forecast versus what actually happened versus what it was adjusted to versus what actually happened. Um, it's also looking at what it recommended in terms of safety stocks and order profiles, what the, the planning team actually did relative to that, and again, what happened. And so what it does is it, so it's, it starts to say, well, this is what the, the, the base of mathematics tell us. But now what we're seeing is actually happening. We're now, we can now make some, again, some finer tuned adjustments within that because we're getting more and more granular data. And so again, it's kind of like your point about the, the, the number of days of, of, um, of certain temperature in terms of its influence on ice cream demand. I mean, it, it, it's also um, you know, interesting to have the right amount of safety stock arrived on Thursday afternoon when I needed it on Thursday morning. Um, so again, we're getting more particulate, more granular, which allows us to be more effective both from a cost and service level perspective. Um, so just, I'll, I'm about to hand over to um, my lovely colleague Luke, who's standing in the back. Um, before I do that, we'll just go to the last slide. So the, the tool set we're gonna show you is one that um, we've been aware of for a long time. Uh, it's called GAINS. Um, it, it does have that complete capability stack um, and has the machine learning and AI built into it. Um, so I'll hand over to Luke to tell you a little bit more about that, and then Nathan will take us through a, a very very curated and very short demo just to give you kind of a taste. So as kind of speaking about machine learning has got wide and broad applicability to a lot of businesses, a lot of areas. Obviously as supply chain professionals, we're really focused in certain aspects of that machine learning. Um, so what we're trying to do now is really just bring it down to a couple of real concrete examples to show how it works in practice. Um, Kaz's earlier slide um, showed three things that we would say is at the core or fundamental of supply chain planning. And we see them quite distinct steps, first being a demand planning step. The demand planning step, what we're basically trying to do is work out what our customers are going to consume or buy. The second step is an inventory optimization step. And what we're trying to do there is basically deliver to that customer what they want, at least total cost for our organization, save as much money as we can, make as much profit as we can. And the third step is making sure that we can get that product where it needs to be on time. So we think about demand planning, inventory optimization, and replacement planning. So what we're gonna show you is basically what, what's the foundation or that sort of base that we need to build the MI off for each of those three steps. So if we think about an advanced planning system, which is what we're gonna demonstrate, that sits beside an ERP system. So the ERP system, as probably everyone's aware in this room, holds all the transactional information, the master data, and we have the advanced planning system to do some more sophisticated work on top of that so we can actually take intelligent action. So if you take demand planning, for example, the foundation or base level of requirement that we would suggest that you'd need before you move into MI would be the ability for the system to generate a statistical forecast by itself based off consumption or demand history. So using a tournament forecast selection process, be able to identify this as the forecast, which will give us the best result with less error. Pretty straightforward. So that's the base level that we need. The second step in that is the inventory optimization step. What we would say would be the base foundation level that you should be considering before moving to MI when we're talking about inventory optimization, which is all about achieving a particular level of service to your customer, at least total cost. So what that system should be able to do is say for every product at every location within your network, this is the amount of safety stock we need to hold based off the cost of holding inventory, the cost of moving inventory, and the level of error we have in our supply, our supply variability, and our demand variability. And so if you're a large retailer, for instance, that might be three million different stocking locations throughout your network, and that's the sort of capability that we would look for in a business. If they're after MI, we would try and establish that before moving them into that MI space. The third area is the replacement planning, and the most base foundation expectation that we would have is that the system would bring up for you, by exception, on a daily basis, anything that you need to take action on in terms of an overstock, understock, or an expedite. Okay, so basically anything that's in a balanced inventory position, a user shouldn't have to look at it or consider it. So that's what we're talking about, the foundation or ease, you know, the, the base that we're after. 
So now if we try and start overlaying MI, what are we looking to do? So rather in the demand planning space, rather than just relying on that consumption history that we have in our system, that transactions, we start to bring in what we'd say extrinsic data, data external to that ERP system. And that external data could be potentially competitor pricing information. It could be the weather. Okay, and to get to that, we need to actually, uh, you know, someone asked that question before, it's actually finding out what are those elements that do have a good correlation, actually do have an impact, and they could be lagging, as Carter mentioned before. If something might have happened four months ago, it has an impact on us now, like a housing starts would often be an indication of that in the construction industry. In the inventory optimization space, rather than looking at what a particular product does in terms of how do we get the cost optimal service for that particular product, that particular location, we can consider the entire network. So rather than potentially having a 99% service level to deliver that service level with very high safety stock at every location, we might be able to say, if we hold a 99.5% service level at one location, we can get away with holding a 60% service level somewhere else and just cop the cost of an expedite to get to that other location in time and thereby save money. So we start to think about this in more holistically and moving from inventory optimization to what we'd say is profit optimization. And then the third example, replacement planning, rather than just showing up exceptions of which a user needs to review and approve or modify, we can now get the machine to say, well, what would have the user done when these exceptions get brought up? And we can put on those, and, and, this, and the system itself can apply the logic to say, in the, under this scenario, a user does not need to intervene. It will automatically know to adjust it, or also cancel it, or to modify it. So I might just hand over to Nathan now to start showing exactly how this works. But when you think about this demonstration, it's in those three components, the demand planning component, inventory optimization, and replacement planning. But it's just a taste of what MI can do. It's not the whole gamut. So I'm Nathan from GRA, uh, manager at GRA. We, yeah, good intro. <laughs> I've been involved with GRA now for about five years and have been um, working primarily on gains implementation. So I've done a few implementations with West Farmers Industrial Safety, um, done one for 7-Eleven currently. So large scale implementations that have various different types of challenges. So this is the gains application. I'll walk you through some of the things that um, Carter and Luke have both touched on. So looking at the three modules, demand planning, inventory optimization, and replenishment planning. But first I want to speak to that base level of forecasting that Luke and Carter have mentioned. So, an organization is built up not just on the number of SKUs, but the number of SKU location combinations. You might think that we've only ranging a thousand SKUs, but we've got a thousand SKUs across a thousand locations. That's a million data points that we need to forecast against. Now, if you multiply that by the number of sales channels that you have, you might have an online sales channel, you might have a um, retail sales channel. So that's two. That one, that one million forecasting data points then becomes two million. Now, from a user perspective, uh, you're going to need a massive team of hundreds and hundreds of people just to review each and every single line item. So what GAINS does is it boils down that 2 million data points into what you really need to focus on. So this is an entry page onto GAINS where we actually have a series of exceptions. We've broken it down into demand planning exceptions, both at a store level, DC level if you wish. You can also look at specific um, business processes such as event management, store management, all those kind of things. So if promotional planning is key to the business, we can create certain exceptions as well to highlight those. There's also the replenishment recommendations and exceptions. So we can walk through what um, is the base level type of exception that you might see on a replenishment. And also we'll walk through what machine learning would then do as well to minimize that data set that you actually need to look at day to day. These little boxes are kind of like a summary of the workflow that a planner needs to do um, during their review period. So we can set up a review period that looks at a monthly review period or a weekly review period. In this particular data set, I think there's about 13,000 item location combinations. You'll see that there won't be 13,000 recommendations that you need to review but it's really looking at specific examples that say, within this review period, you've actually got 437 forecasts that are either biased or volatile. Now, during the review period, we've actually done some forecast approval, so a person's actually looked at it. We've actually moved that down to 336. So for the rest of the period, we actually have 336 forecast reviews to, be, um, to make. What's nice about this view is that it not only gives the users a sense of where they're at during the week or during the month, but it also allows you know, um, planning team managers to actually analyze process 
flow as well to go, okay, well, this one's actually, even though this planner has um, a thousand SKUs, this person's only got 50, this one might actually be more highly volatile, more errors, so their workload is actually much, much higher. So it also allows a bit of rebalancing as well between team members. This screen is the base forecasting screen. It's what we call the forecast summary screen. There's multiple levels to this. So you can either view two years of history, two years of forecast, both at a monthly level, weekly level, and a daily level. We also have the ability to group by certain article attributes. So for example, if you wanted to review what a state was doing, you could roll it up at a state level. If you wanted to see specific sites, specific categories, inventory classes, it's all made pretty possible and pretty easy to view everything at the aggregate level. The bottom level here, is your lower level detail. So in this instance, it's basically an article at one particular location. If you had article by location by sales channel, that would be displayed down that lower level as well. So the, the row that's highlighted at the moment is the pastry level. And these are all the art article locations that make up the pastry. So there's beef pies, there's halal pies, um, sausage rolls. At a base level, gains will use intrinsic factors such as sales history. We take up to three years of demand history to build up a, a history profile, which can be reviewed by a demand planner. It will then generate a statistical two-year forecast. And I'm just showing you this particular screen, which runs through the various forecasting models that GAINS has. So GAINS has within itself um, about 35 different forecasting models. If you think about those two million item location channel loca um, combinations, that's actually being multiplied by 35. So 2 million by 35, 70. It's actually doing 70 forecast tournament selections every single night or every single run. So the amount of power behind this tool is, is, is quite significant. So each, each module, uh, each batch run, it'll actually run through model one through to 35. It'll then rank each of these models and how they perform. So Carter mentioned that out of the demand planning module, not only do you get a forecast, you actually get a forecast error. And GAINS has some innate ability to um, decide whether or not it matches the demand pattern. So it'll look at it and say, that roughly matches our history, that's okay. It'll also flag certain um, forecasts for review if it's deemed to be biased or volatile as well. So GAINS will automatically select the forecast model that has the least amount of forecast error, but also if that forecast model is biased, it'll say, maybe let's look at the next one down. We don't want to choose a biased forecast as our main forecast moving forward. The classic example of that is when you have um, new product launches. When you have a new product, history looks like that. A uh, base model would say forecast also looks like that, but at some point it's going to plateau. So games will say, this is the best matching forecast statistically, but realistically, that's not the one that we should be applying. You need to look at it. What I'll do now is I'll show you what the machine learning layer is on top of this as well. So when we talk about machine learning, we can feed in extrinsic variables, things like weather, things like price changes, things like promotional activity. Typically, when we go into an organization, they'll say, it'll be great to know what our competitors are doing. If we can feed all that information in, we'll be able to know, you know what levers, what they're doing so that we can react to it. The next question is, how do we get that data? Go, oh, that, that, that's actually really hard. So. Typically what we, we would suggest is you look at what internal information you have. So not just what's external, but things like price changes, um, price changes relative to other items as well. So the example that we're gonna walk through is a 1.5 liter bottle of water. Now this particular organization has uh, various sizes. They've got a 1.5 liter, the two liter 600 mil bottle. And what we're doing there is we're mapping the actual retail price of each of them, but not just the retail price of a particular SKU, the retail price of the SKU relative to the next size up or the next size down. So there is a correlation. So if, if there is, um, if the price gap between the two bottles, so a 600 mil bottle and a 1.5 liter bottle shrinks, you'll find that some people go, it's actually better value to buy the 1.5 liter bottle than the 600 mil bottle. So you see that sales on the 600 mil bottle might decline, sales of the 1.5 liter bottle might increase. And then how does that impact the two liter bottle as well? So I'll show you a quick example of that. This screen is what we call the forecast detail screen. It's just a different view um, on the forecast, primarily at the monthly level. But what it provides us the ability to do is to analyze not just what history was doing to it, but also what um, our extrinsic variables are doing to it as well. 
So there are three, potential, three data feeds that we're feeding into this. We're feeding in the retail price of the SKU. We're feeding in the price gap of this versus the 600 mil bottle. And we're also feeding in the percentage of sales um, of the category as well. So how, well, what was the percentage of sales within a month of this particular um, bottle of water versus the whole drinks category? So it might have taken 70% um, of the population of the sales, but it would learn from that and go, okay, what, what's the next forecast? So if we're heading towards a warmer month, such as spring or summer, you'd expect that the percentage of sales of water would increase the energy increases, and Gaines would be able to recommend that. Gaines also has the ability to look at leading indicators, so leading periods. Just because you make a change to the system doesn't mean that it's going to impact it straight away. If you make a change to the system, you might see it a month later, two months later, or three months later. Gaines will then play out each of these scenarios, so not just each of these variables, so your price gap now, You'll say, what is the impact of the price gap if you change it now versus a month's time versus two months' time versus three months' time? On this screen, these are the graphs that are being displayed. The green line displays your history profile across the last two years. The blue line displays the percentage of drink sales for this population. We also have the retail price and the price gap. You'll notice that in this section here, We've got that checkbox there to say we're excluding insignificant variables. So out of all the data elements that we've been feeding in, we've fed one, two, three, four variables multiplied by six leading periods. So that's 24 potential variables that it's looking at. It said that for this particular item location, there are only two that actually have a significant impact on the history in the forecast. So out of those 24 variables, or 24 combinations, there are only two that matter to this particular item location combination. You might find that this bottle of water in Queensland will behave differently to Victoria, and there'll be different levers there as well, just because of the um, sales pattern at a store level. One of the examples that we'd like to use there is um, gumboots. So you might have gumboots that are stocked in Victoria, gumboots that are stocked in uh, Queensland. In Queensland, you'll see that during the um, you know, winter months, there might be some unexpected demand that pops up because of flooding and et cetera, all, all that kind of stuff. So if those events can be built into the system, Gaines has the ability to recognize and say, there's potential that this event might occur again in the future, so we need to uplift our demand profile. As an input, these are the various um, price gap changes, so you can see relative to um, each month what the retail price change was. So you don't actually have to look at that information, it's just there for those statistical-minded people. What we also do is we also feed in future leading indicators. So what, not just what the retail price was two years ago, 23 months ago, 20 months ago, we also say, what do we plan on putting in as a price increase? The reason why we say focus on what internal data you have first is that it's a lot easier to control your own price versus what your competitor's doing. So in this instance, we fed in that over the next two months, our retail price will be growing from $4.20 to $4.30 to $4.40, and there is also a price point difference as well between that and the 600 mil bottle. What Gaines has then done to the data is it's looked at it and said, next month I was originally planning to sell 176, but because of my price gap difference, I'm now forecasting to sell 119 units. So Gaines will do that automatic adjustment. Now the reason why we limit it to these two, or three potentially, um, data points is we don't want to touch the forecast too far ahead. We only want to look at, at a horizon that makes sense. So with this particular item, there's a lead time of you know a day to a week. You don't want to be making changes to the forecast three months out unless you have a known promotion. So we've walked through the base forecasting models. Um, Gaines will do a tournament selection based on 35 different algorithms. A user then can then overlay their own intelligence over the top of the history or forecasting profile, and the machine learning can then be input to enhance the process as well. Following on from the forecasting module, I'll take you to the inventory optimization module and just walk through what that looks like as well. So when Luke mentioned earlier that we take into account a whole bunch of costs, we take into account the cost of holding stock, the cost of um, receiving stock, the cost of utilities as well to run your DCs, all of those elements need to be taken into account. 
what GAINS does is it looks at order quantities and says, okay, what is the most optimal order quantity for this particular combination, for this particular item location combination? So if you order in lots of ones, you might find yourself ordering every single day. If you order in lots of hundreds, you might find yourself ordering once a week. So GAINS will find that right balance between your ordering quantity and your safety stock. In this particular example, we've got a, I think it's a two-day lead time. We have a carrying cost set to 15%. So that basically says, you know, for every dollar, I'm, I'm actually carrying 15 cents additional over the next year. It'll cost us $13 per PO to get this into the network. And we also have there the lead time variability. What GAINS also does at a base level is it builds in your supply constraints. If the supplier says, you can only order in lots of 20, GAINS needs to factor that into account as well. So if GAINS says, your optimal ordering quantity is 21, does that have to then round down to 20 or 20 or 40 or round up to 40? If it rounds up to 40, your safety stock will decrease. If it rounds down to 20, your safety stock might have an increase as well. So there's a balancing out between these two parameters. The next level on top of that is to do some what-if analysis. So what if we had to expedite? How much additional cost would we incur if we had to expedite? This is a graph that models your total annual cost versus your service level target. So in this particular instance, I think we've set a um, service level target of 98%. At 98%, our total annual cost is $650. If we were to drop our service level down to 70%, meaning that 30% of the time a customer walks into a store, they won't have, uh, they'll have an empty shelf. That actual annual cost is about $500. If we were to do some modeling, we'd say, you know, the normal cost of getting a PO in is $13.19. Um, if we were to expedite it, we'll mark that up to $20 because we need it urgently. It's out of cycle with our supplier. They say, well, you know, if you want it, you have to pay a little bit more for it. So what we've done here is we've entered in an expedite cost of $20. It's basically now said, well, for every single miss that you have, if you want to make the sale, you need to expedite it. So this has then added in an expedite cost component to the graph. And what this graph shows me is that it's actually more cost effective over the year to hold a higher level of service than to hold a lower level of service. If I were to promise my customers 70% service level, but I would actually have to in incur additional um, expedite costs to make up those lost sales, I'm actually spending just under $900. Whereas if I had still my 98, 99% service level, I'm still only just incurring the $800 mark. So there's a little bit of modeling that comes into this. Where we find this really handy is when you're changing um, supplier models. If you're moving from a local supplier to an import supplier, your lead times increase, but your cost might decrease as well. What you can also build into here is the disservice costs. So what happens if we lose a sale? Will we lose our customer forever? Will they go elsewhere as well? So there are all these little factors that you can play into this kind of model. Not just um, to, not, not just to um, perform a little bit of what is GAINS doing, but also what can that do in my new um, supply chain network as well. The next screen that I'd like to show you is what we call the order builder screen. That provides the users with exceptions to say, hey look, I think that these ones are going to be out of stock during our lead time or projected to be out of stock in our lead time. And then it would flag for um, replenishment planners an action. So as Luke mentioned, we don't really care about our balance stock. There's no action to do that. There's no action to review. There, there will be no action. What I've clicked on is replenishment for today. What gains can build in is also dedicated planning cycles. So if you have a supplier that supplies into a particular store Mondays and Fridays only, you'll only get recommendations on Mondays and Fridays. What GAINS can also do is then throw up other exceptions to say, even though you're ordering Mondays and Fridays, you're actually projected to be out of stock on a Wednesday. So you might be actually incurring some additional expediting costs as well if you were to bring that in. This is what we call the order builder screen. Top section there displays a few um, graphs. A lot of people like working with graphs. A lot of people like working with data. It depends on the type of person you are. If I look at a graph, I can understand it instantly. If I look at data, it takes me a little bit of time just to go, what is this actually telling me? <clears throat> so some of the inputs that we can actually feed in are um, vendor minimums and vendor maximums. Obviously, if you haven't hit your vendor minimum yet, you want gains to actually tell you, hey, look, we haven't hit our minimum yet. What do we need to do to get that up to our maximum? Uh, sorry, to, to meet our minimums. On the flip side, if we are over our approval limit, let's say that you need approval from your supply chain manager if you're exceeding X amount of dollars, 
you can actually get gain to pull that back a little bit as well to say, we've got a limit of $1,000, you're actually purchasing a 2,000 in there. Um, if we drop it down to 1,000, what actually will we be purchasing? So rather than leaving the decision up to the demand plan or the replenishment planner to decide, hey, look, I'm going to drop this one down, this one down, this one down, Gaines will actually say, you need these ones first before you need the rest. There's a summary section which shows you the purchase order equivalent. So in this one, we're actually shipping from a supplier 100351 into the receiving site 1003. This has been made up of four order lines as well. So you can see here that we are ordering $500 worth and we are well within our bounds. If we were to click on this particular item line, you can see there that there's actually only one order line being recommended for this particular store, that it comes up to $45. Our minimum actually is $100, so we need to do something about that as well. So Gaines does have the ability to use a set target quantity where we can actually bring up the order value. When we use that target quantity, we can also bring it up not just based on dollar amounts, we can do palletization, so number of pallets, number of cartons, number of layers, as well as number of units. So the example that Carter and I were at yesterday was uh, we were at a musical um, organization and they've got a war that they fill with guitars. So they actually have um, rounding factors not based on volume or anything, but based on each's. And they say, look, we don't have any storage space in the back, on the wall we can fit 12 guitars. We can also feed into the fact that Gaines uh, sees we've got eight on hand. Gaines might recommend another eight to be ordered, but we can only have space for four. So which four do we actually choose? You can get Gaines to make that decision for you. Once Gaines has been up and running for a period of time, we can also establish um, some learning attributes as to what a replenishment planner has been doing. So we can say that Gaines has, has recognized that for low cost, low lead time, low error items, typically the plan just goes, accept the order. Classic example of that is rubber bands, right? Rubber bands are cheap, they come in small boxes. You might not um, think about them too much, you just go, oh, they come up in an order, I just accept it. Whereas if it's a bathtub that's big and bulky and takes up lots of storage space within your DCs, Gaines might say, hey, look, I'm not going to auto-approve this one because typically when a planner looks at it, they go, yeah, I don't need 20 units of that. It takes too much space. I'm going to drop it down to 8 or 10. So Gaines will know, I'm going to stay away from those ones. I'll look at these ones. So when we switch on this learning capability, Gaines has the ability to recognize certain patterns. So in this particular data set, this one is actually an approval of an order line or a particular order. Um, it looks at anything that is less than two days of lead time. The average cost, it's found to be, well, if it's under $6.60, generally the plan is accepted outright. And if there's a lead time forecast error less than two units as well, it'll say auto approve, auto approve. So this takes away a lot of the decision making that the planners have to do. If you think about um, what, a, what a replenishment plan has to do day to day, they have to review order lines, accept, accept. This can actually take away some of those mundane tasks and actually focus them more on those containerizations, those big ticket items that are big and bulky rather than looking at the small ones that just run through the system always. So that kind of rounds out um, the gains demonstration. So we looked at demand forecasting, which looks at building a base forecast based on your intrinsic um, data, so three years worth of history. That then gets overlaid with user adjustments. We then overlay the machine learning aspect to it where we feed in extrinsic data. That can be uh, pricing, weather, promotions, um, competitor, competitors, um, promotions as well, and competitor pricing. We then looked at inventory optimization, which builds a um, safety stock and order quantity profile based on ordering costs, carrying costs. You can then do a little bit of modeling on top of that as well to build in your expedite costs, disservice costs, what happens if I change my lead time, what happens if my cost increases over time. So that can actually um, inform you how to build your future network. And on the replenishment side, it's really about taking away workload from replenishment planners to focus on the big ticket items. All in all, it's a really exciting area, I think primarily because it's, it's now bringing into the realm of possibility um, the discussions that I know I've been having for the last 20 years about all this extra stuff that really didn't have a great way of being dealt with. So again, we had um, some very powerful tools for 
forecasting and planning, but there's always this question about, but we know things happen when we make adjustments, or we, we change prices, or we input promotions, but we're not really exactly sure how to kind of deal with that in a holistic way that gives us the actual insight to then go back and apply. Um, so that was kind of, there was the, there was kind of the, um, you know, the white art, if you will, and there was, there was the black art, which was how do you deal with this sort of stuff. Now we have a way of dealing with it, which is great. And so again, the question is, I think is, does it make a difference? So Nathan showed a really good example of a, of a whole bunch of things that might have made a difference, but we got to see what actually does make a difference. So we can, um, I think a really great way of moving into machine learning and artificial intelligence is some proof of concept. Um, you know, is it worth the investment? Is it worth the computing power? Does it make the forecast and the plan more accurate? Let's have a look at that before, as I said, we go out and roll that out. Um, because it is a process of refinement. So anyway, I think it's the great news that it's actually here and it's working. So um, I think the next you know, five to seven years, we'll see some really exciting developments in that area.